Good evening. This is Dr. Marnie Falk from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and I am delighted to welcome you this evening. Join us for our second Mitochondrial Medicine Next Generation Therapeutics uh, live panel session. It's really incredibly exciting to have so many partners across the country and the world, both among our families and advocacy colleagues, and also, of course, among the life sciences and pharma partners. Um, here at uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, we seek to develop therapies uh, and improved understanding of mitochondrial disease, and it's essential that we all partner together. We had a wonderful CME day today with updates on all of the clinical trials, as well as on um, a lot of the ways to support families. And this evening, uh, we are really uh, delighted uh, to have had so many life science companies sponsor us and be willing to participate in this um, activity where they will directly be uh, interacting with families uh, in a way that we can all learn from each other. Uh, I would specifically like to thank our sponsors, if we could move to the next slide, um, who sponsored us at variable levels, uh, generously supporting um, philanthropic uh, um, uh, efforts uh, to develop uh, improved um, ways uh, to support research uh, in mitochondrial medicine at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So we've had uh, Summit Health Pharmacy, Cyclarion, Laramar Therapeutics, Minovia Mitochondrial Cell Therapy, Mitobridge and Estellas Company, Dr. Dan DiPietro, Self Biotherapeutics, Reneo Pharmaceuticals, uh, all uh, generously supporting um, our research efforts uh, here tonight. I think this is going to be a really exciting um, event uh, for the next 90 minutes or so, uh, similar to how we started it last year, um, but really even more exciting because I will not be moderating the panels. Um, I'm delighted to say that we actually have um, expert families um, uh, leading the sessions. Our first session will be interviews of um, and discussions of the life science companies uh, moderated by Kevin Malloy. Mr. Malloy is the founder and managing partner of Iron Triangle Partners, a billion dollar healthcare equity hedge fund. Prior to Iron Triangle, Mr. Malloy served as healthcare sector head for JANA Partners LLC from 2016 to 2019. Previously, he spent eight years as managing director and portfolio manager of Decade Capital, a healthcare equity subsidiary of Millennium Management LLC. Early in his career, Mr. Malloy held a number of executive roles in strategy consulting and life sciences, including serving as Chief Operating Officer and Acting Chief Executive Officer of People's Genetics, Inc., a DNA sequencing startup company, which was acquired by Beckman Coulter. Mr. Malloy is a graduate of the College of William & Mary and received an MBA from the Wharton School. He is married with three children and lives in Greenwich, Connecticut. Following the Life Sciences panel for 30 minutes, led by uh, Mr. Malloy, we are um, honored uh, to have Casey Woolabin lead a parent panel where families, um, we're, we're sorry, where Pharma will be answer, asking questions of families. Uh, Casey is known uh, by many in the community. Uh, she is a rare disease mom and co-founder of Cure Mito and Rare Village Foundations. She has a passion for helping other rare disease families navigate their journey in finding cures for their loved ones. Following uh, the parent panel led by uh, Casey, we will have a question answer session from the audience with follow up from all of our panelists. We encourage uh, all participants to use the Q&A box to enter their questions at any point um, during the meeting so that the moderator, uh, Colleen Urescu, uh, will be able to pass these on um, to the uh, session chairs. Again, thank you to everybody for participating, both the life science companies and the parents, and I hand it off to you, Mr. Malloy. Thank you, Marnie. Um, thanks very much to uh, everyone for uh, the opportunity to be a part of this today. Marnie, this is uh, incredibly exciting, and your, uh, your team enables uh, us to keep pushing ahead with great research in, um, in the MITO world. We're all very thankful to you and your team's efforts. So, um, Listen, we're, we're very fortunate today to have assembled such a strong panel of leaders from the MITO drug development world to address the questions from our community. Uh, specifically today, we have six senior managers from biotechnology firms addressing a range of mitochondrial diseases, including Friedrich's ataxia, McArdle disease, 
Pearson syndrome, primary, primary mitochondrial myopathies, long chain fatty acid oxidation disorders, and others. So that's John, Alex, Nancy, Brian, Chris, and Olivier. It's a remarkable collection of uh, senior managers from biotech. Additionally, we have Vince, who um, is an owner of a leading compounding pharmacy with really unique capabilities in mito nutritional supplements, as well as other areas. Um, and, um, and then we have a leading life science investor in Dan, who previously founded Aceris and spun out Modus Therapeutics. So he too is another successful biotechnology entrepreneur and a, and a thought leader in the space as well. We have an incredibly exceptional group of uh, folks here today. So we're gonna use this time to explore the questions that were submitted by parents ahead of the event and time permitting, additional Q&A. Uh, so we invite you to submit your questions and we'll do our best to either air them here today or uh, with the panel, or we'll get back to you offline. Don't be shy. This is a pretty unique opportunity to get your questions addressed by a panel of amazing thought leaders who are working hard to find therapeutic solutions for, for our children. Um, so with that, let's, uh, let's get started and get into, into the Q&A. Um, I'm gonna start with a sort of a big picture question, um, and I'd actually like to, like to send this over to um, Dan DiPietro just to get started. Um, I'm, uh, I'm curious, you know, relative to other areas of rare disease, Dan, just to get us started, what inning do you think we're in in understanding the basic biology behind mitochondrial disease? Um, so, you know, the rare, rare disorders, orphan disorders have become a, a big area of focus in the therapeutics world. I'm just curious to this group and starting with you, what inning do you think we're in and having the basics covered? So great question. Um, I think one of the biggest advances that I've seen sort of in the last 10 years is um, understanding that not all mitochondrial diseases are the same and that each mitochondrial disease has very distinct biologies behind them. Uh, understanding the genetic basis for different mitochondrial diseases, I think, has really changed the field. And so I think I, I might I might not give you the exact inning um, that we're in. I'm trying to sort of struggle with that. Um, but I think we're in different innings at different disease states because, because of that fundamental change in um, the perception of mitochondrial disease, not just as a kind of a, uh, a single entity, but, but rather distinct diseases with distinct etiologies and therefore distinct therapeutic approaches. Helpful. Maybe um, Nancy, do you, uh, do you have any perspective on this as a chief medical officer of a, of a leading player in the space? Uh, yes, uh, so we're working on um, therapeutic for Friedrich's ataxia. And what I find is that uh, there are many ways that you can address a particular problem. And the fact that we now have so many alternatives that are in development, there's still no, no approved therapy, but there are a number of drugs that are in early stage, mid stage, and even late stage development. It's encouraging to see that 10 years ago, we didn't have uh, as many potential candidates as we have now. And at least in Friedrich's ataxia, we are relatively close to have a candidate a file an NDA, which is uh, not us, it's, it's somebody else. But it just really tells us how much more advanced we are now uh, than we were 10 years ago. And I think to Dan's point, uh, I used to think that all mitochondrial diseases were the same and that perhaps one bullet, we could kill all of them. And I've learned that that's not the truth, that the truth is exactly what Dan says. Um, you have to approach each one of these diseases with uh, uh, a targeted approach and a different perspective. So uh, I do think that we are much more far along than we were about 10 years ago. That's great to hear. Um, that's a great transition too, I think, to the next question, which is, um, and it, it's intentionally a big picture question. We're gonna you know, drill into some more specifics uh, later, but how deep and rich in your assessment is the overall pipeline of emerging therapeutics today relative to 10 years ago in mito disorders broadly. So 
you know, each of you is is part of organizations that are pushing forward on a, a small number of, of um, specific mitochondrial disorders. I'm curious, uh, and the group is curious, and the parents are curious, you know, how rich and deep do you think the overall therapeutics pipeline landscape is in mito development? Um, and maybe, um, you know, maybe just to, to get things going, we could hand it off to, to John Campbell for his perspective here. Sure. Thanks, Kevin. Um, you know, I think we've come a long way from 10 years ago, uh, for certain. Uh, you know, I think the debate between broadly targeting mitochondrial disease and targeting individual genotypes or phenotypes is progressing. Uh, you know, but there still remains uh, quite a gap between understanding sort of the genotype phenotype relationship, uh, which I think has a bearing on our ability to deliver, you know, therapeutic uh, agents because uh, of the heterogeneity uh, and some of the questions regarding the population that you're studying. So we've made progress, but there's still progress uh, to be made. Alex, um, anything, uh, any thoughts on this topic? Yeah, I mean, in general, I would say this. I mean, your initial question was, in what inning are we in comparison to other fields, right? And I would submit that we're not in competition with other fields. We're in synergy with other fields. So some, are, some areas of development, I mean, mitochondrial myopathies and mitochondrial diseases will benefit from research in multiple other areas. You know, everything that is happening with gene therapy, with gene splicing and edit everything that is happening with, with, with transplantation in general it will be of benefit to the patients with mitochondrial uh, diseases. So in general, I would say we are actually eons ahead of where we were 10 years ago in general in medicine. I mean, the fact, the fact that you can do, we just talked about genotyping, the fact that you can do genotyping now for just a handful of bucks in comparison to the six, eight thousand dollars you, yep. you had to spend, you know, just a few years back. The, this technology has evolved so rapidly and it has become so efficient and so relatively cheap in comparison to where it was 10 years ago. So just that, it's an explosion of information for us. Now, in terms of how deep the, the, the pipeline is, it's very, very deep. It's deeper than we think. Actually, you, you know, we are, we took a, a different path than others. You know, others have looked specifically at trying to design a drug that can specifically address a problem in the mitochondrial field. We actually took the opposite direction. We, we looked at the drugs that were out there that we thought could potentially be of benefit to patients with mitochondrial diseases, and we brought them into the field. So I think there are, there are multiple opportunities in the future to find more drugs that, that have potential to benefit patients with mitochondrial diseases. There is gene therapy that is happening in other fields. There is, you know, gene editing, there are exon skipping. I mean, all these drugs that are out there that I think are informing us on what can potentially benefit patients with mitochondrial diseases. So I think there is a lot of reason to be very hopeful and a lot of reason to be very enthusiastic about, you know, trying to stay as healthy as possible for as long as possible because medicine is, is moving at a much faster pace than when I was a student in medical school. That's great context. Um... Thank you for that. So, um, look, why don't we just, you know, the parents here, more than anything, want to hear about promising therapies. You know, we can, we can think about other disease states like cardiovascular, where statins were a major leap forward in our ability to treat the, the disease states, or in cancer, um, you know, breakthroughs in immuno-oncology and things like PD-1s and PD-L1s in recent history have changed our lens on therapy radically. I'm curious to this group, what do you view as the most promising potential therapeutics for mito disorders that are either in the clinic today or you think are very close to being in the clinic? And I know, you know, each of you have your own particular projects that you, you know, are hopeful that you're successful, but I'm, 
Uh, I'm curious, the group is curious for your bigger picture view as experts in the space. Maybe, um, maybe Brian, we could, we could start with you. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a great, great question. And I, I think, you know, as competitively, we keep an eye on, on the different products that are going there. And I think some of the earlier people have spoken, I think it's going to be a multi drug approach to mito disease because of both the genotype and the phenotypical areas that it's in. I think the panelists here have interesting um, targets that they are looking at specifically. You know, when you talk about uh, uh, PPARs being, you know, reformulated or with Friedrich's attacks, you're looking specifically there. So I, I think broadly that as we get closer into phase three, I think, Kevin, the big thing for us and for all of us and the, and the families will be um, to get something across the finish line. So once we can get something approved, then it's a roadmap for the others to follow. And then also, I think, bring in more investment and interest into this area. Brian, just to follow up on that, um, do you see the real opportunity here for, um, just in terms of time to market, taking repurposed molecules that we know are safe, right? So they've already gotten through clinical trials. We know that there's a good safety profile and we have a plausible uh, mechanism of action in MITO and then pursuing that. Or do you think a lot of the MITO disorders that you and your team look at require de novo innovation? Like they're gonna, it's gonna require new molecules. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think that um, I think we may see some nice incremental improvements with repurposed uh, uh, chemical uh, entities that are, have been out there before, Kevin. So I think maybe some bigger steps might be through the gene therapies and some of the things we're all working on as well with that. So I'll take any incremental benefit and you know that we can get from initially. But I think maybe some of the bigger home runs to go back to your baseball analogy may be some something new out there that maybe we don't even know about yet. Chris Winrow, any um, any perspective on this topic? Most promising therapies? Yeah, I think, I mean, you're hearing a lot from different groups here that are taking a number of different approaches. And I, I agree wholeheartedly, it's gonna be likely a combination of approaches that's most effective. Um, I think it's also addressing different aspects of the disease and really understanding from parents and, and the families what's important. And I think, you know, for us, we've taken an approach to target, uh, you know, aspects of the central nervous system we have a molecule that gets into the brain and, and we're sort of at an earlier stage of understanding that. But I think it's an example of how we can look at different organ systems and different uh, issues that parents uh, and, and patients face and, and really address them head on. So I think uh, I'm, I'm excited to see others in, in, in the field also taking you know, similar approaches to, to really understand what's important. This is such an important topic. I'm gonna to ask for the perspective of, of one more person. Olivier, you are there, correct? No on on Olivia. Okay, Kevin. Kevin, maybe I can just uh, I, I wanted to just sort of maybe amplify something Christopher said because I think it was really really important. That'd this be concept great. Of, this concept of um, uh, defining the most troublesome symptom that a patient is 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 suffering from I think is extremely important in mitochondrial disease because most of the mitochondrial diseases that we all study you know are multi systemic diseases and the question always um, comes up as to what is your primary endpoint. And I think there needs to be a narrowing of that in the cases of lots of, many of the mitochondrial diseases, rather than trying to hit all, all organ systems um, with one particular therapy, which I think is unrealistic in a lot of cases, um, narrowing that down. And that's something that I think the parents, um, since they're on the front lines, are going to be extremely important and you know instrumental in changing that paradigm uh, because obviously you go to you go, you do a pu you do a publication search for for any of the mitochondrial diseases and most of them you know right in the front right in the abstract multisystemic manifest in many different ways heter the heterogeneity which has been talked about before but if we can somehow narrow down um, those uh, manifestations to a to a specific endpoint that we can study in a larger group of those patients, it, I think, will just increase the odds of success tremendously. And that's something so that right. I think, you know, working in, working in parallel, working hand in hand with, uh, with the families is gonna be very important. Dan, you're, you're highlighting one of the, you know, one of the important challenges in, in I guess, trial design, right, and endpoint design, making sure that we, um, we stack the deck for success in the, in the clinical trials that are coming. Nancy, um, 
I'm curious for your perspective on this. I, I, uh, one of our panelists alluded to this earlier, but challenging therapies, right, as a, as a, a possible um, arrow in our quiver here for mito diseases. Do you see those uh, uh, particular therapeutic options as important to moving the ball forward in, in mitochondrial disease? Uh, yes, and I, and I think, you know, going back to your prior question, is it going to be drugs that are already out there that we're going to repurpose or new drugs? I think the answer is both. And just to give you an example, you know, we're working uh, on a molecule that delivers frataxin, or it's designed to deliver frataxin to the mitochondria, which is the protein that is deficient in Friedrich's ataxia. So that's a novel approach. However, there are a number of other medications in Friedrich's ataxia that have been used for other indications that are also being studied. Uh, most recently, I just heard about vitamin D as a possibility. Uh, and there's a study that's, that's going to be done. So uh, I think that novel drugs are going to be important, but we shouldn't um, diminish the importance of existing drugs that could actually um, play an incremental role. And uh, it, there's always a possibility that not all drugs are going to be um, the best for every patient. I mean, each individual may have different patient characteristics and um, different drugs may be needed for different people. So it all depends on, you know, as long as drugs are safe, then we have to test their effectiveness. And um, I, I do think that the more research we do, the more compounds we study, the more compounds that are available, the better the patients are going to be. Right. So um, maybe we could just transition over. Um, I, I'm going to come back to drug development and some of the challenges there, but I'm just talk about a slightly different topic that is very important to to all the parents as well, and that is the role of nutrition in in mitochondrial health. Um, and you can think about it, you know. Uh, in a simplistic way. So, you know, guiding principles on basic nutrition that this group of experts would say is a, is a no-brainer for parents to, to um, uh, have some focus and make sure to get it right. But then also curious about thoughts on specific supplements that um, uh, we should be considering. Uh, maybe um, here we can, uh, we can start with Vince. Um, Vince, I, 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 uh, I'm curious for your, uh, your perspective on this topic. <clears throat> so, I mean, it, it's it's mixed depending on the patient, only because there's always going to be taste, texture, and tolerability issues for the patients, which is what we run into the most. Most of the mitochondrial families have to take medicine that is very high dose in order to work, and sometimes the, the negative side effects of, of taste or bad texture inhibit that. So, I mean, always using uh, supplements that are of the best quality is, is what I can say. I've seen work the best and we get the best results from, but it's, it's just uh, unfortunately because every mito patient is different, their tolerability to the, uh, to the supplements is different also. So, a bit, bit of a loaded question, but you, you always want to make sure that you have the best possible uh, supplementation that you can tolerate. Oh, all right. Can anybody hear me? Kevin, I can hear you. Yep. Kevin, you're muted. You're muted, Kevin. Olivier, we, we hear you now. Great. Bingo. So, um, so to the group, I'm curious. Uh, maybe, maybe Olivia, if you have a point of view on this, are there guiding principles in basic nutrition um, that uh, you would suggest to to parents um, in this area, just for mito health? Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I just fell off because there were some technical difficulties. But um, uh, well, that totally depends on what kind of pathophysiology you're you're looking at. I think so. I think the whole problem with the well, not problem, but the challenge with uh, uh, fighting mitochondrial disease is that it's that it's uh, extremely general. So uh, depends on what you what you want to treat. Um, but no, I don't have any specific 
um, food I would recommend now. Anyone else on the panel have a strong point of view on nutrition? I guess the only thing I would say is that, uh, you know, different mitochondrial diseases are, are, are different. And so maybe the nutritional needs may be different, uh, not just because of the underlying cause, but perhaps also the stage of the disease and what nutrients are needed may be different uh, in early stages than maybe at later stages of disease. Got it. So um, an inbound question from a parent um, who, frankly, just on new therapeutics uh, or emerging therapeutics in, in phase two or, or further along that you know, might actually be uh, clinically available within the next couple of years, some specifics. So um, I'd love to hear from uh, three or four of you from companies that actually have products in development. Maybe just talk about your lead molecule and um, and what you think, if, if your programs are successful, might be a reasonable uh, timeline before you could possibly, if all goes well, be in a position to bring a product to market. Um, maybe we could start with, um, you know, uh, John Campbell. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's a big question, uh, Kevin. It is. <laughs> I think you know we'd like it to be uh, as soon as possible. I think that's the answer. You know, but I think you know some of the challenges that we face in designing trials. Uh, we're we're looking at a cell therapy currently in a disease called Pearson syndrome, which is very rare. Uh, so there's a limitation on uh, the available patients for trials um, you know I think we're we're looking to get uh, into the US clinic uh, and, and it you know expand from Israel uh, in in the latter parts of 2022 uh, that would be an achievement for us and and we would go from there but uh, yeah. Alex so so our our molecule I I think is is it, Ours is a P part delta agonist, and um, as I mentioned earlier, this was a molecule that was previously developed by another company for other purposes. So we were lucky that we already had all of the phase one, the early testing in humans uh, available. So we went straight into patients with PMM, and we actually completed I think the first trial with a PPAR delta in patients with PMM, uh, and now we're into the phase 2B clinical trial. That trial uh, has the potential uh, to, 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 to give us data that, 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 that could uh, initiate discussions with regulatory agencies for, for use in, in this population. So at this point, the key element for us is, is I wish I could give you very firm dates, but mm -hmm. you know this COVID pandemic threw a wrench on all of us, and and uh, uh, we were parked for for about 11 months, not enrolling new patients into trials uh, because everything came to a halt, and uh, centers are only beginning to activate now, and even in the best centers, we are finding that it is not that easy to get started because. There have been shifts in personnel. They have been shifts in 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 resources and availability to to perform the clinical trials. But putting that aside, we're very excited our, about our molecule. Like we, we think that our molecule has the potential to to make it through. And and at this point, what I could say is that success depends on being able to enroll patients into the trial enroll the right patients that need to go into the trial and answer the question and, 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 and then have those discussions with the regulators uh, uh, to move it forward. So um, now uh, in terms of uh, in terms of when do we think this this can happen? It all depends, as I said, in enrollment. We are our study is open for enrollment in a few centers in the U.S. already and in, in, in Europe as well and in other continents. So, 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 so it's all, it's all about, you know, we anticipate typically it takes, I don't know, 
anywhere between nine to 12, 18 months to enroll the studies. And, and uh, if, if, if we get more participation and we can enroll the study faster, we can finish a little earlier. If, 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 if things continue to be delayed, it may take a little longer. But, but, but once you complete the study, you still need to analyze all of the data. You need to put together a package. You need to go to the regulatory agencies. And depending on the type of review that you will get from the regulatory agencies, that could be anywhere between six to nine or 12 months. Sometimes it takes a little longer for some, for some, so, some uh, uh, drugs. But what I can say is this. If there's anything we could, we can say about the pandemic that was good is that when the FDA wants to do things fast, they can do it fast. <laughs> so, so we, it's up to, uh, and I think that this is where I think the parent organizations can be very helpful, uh, uh, where, where patients need it through their organizations and there are well organized groups of parents with mitochondrial diseases in the U.S. I think that there needs to be pressure on the FDA so that they understand that this is a matter of life and death for these patients, that this is a serious issue for them, that we need their attention, we need them to react uh, to the data and uh, uh, not to delay the process. And to the extent that that can be done, you know, a partnership between us trying to be as nimble as possible and rolling the studies very quickly with the clinical centers and then parents exerting pressure on the FDA, I think that could make things happen a little faster. That's great. Alex. So that's a great transition to my next question. Parents want to help, right? We want to be parts of the solution. So um, we're curious about patient registries, about advocacy and PR for our unique populations, right? There, are there any lessons that we can learn from the experience of Sarepta and Duchesne with parents that were very actively involved? Um, and then, you know, working with academic medical centers to push preclinical work ahead with groups like Marnie's and hopefully drive to a target and then consider out, out licensing and trying to get a program across the finish line. Nancy, maybe you could start. What, what are your thoughts on things, the most important things we as parents can be doing to try and be part of the solution and move ahead. And then I'll go to Olivier with the same question. So I'm going to give you an example uh, in Friedrichs Ataxia, since that's the field where I'm working. There's an organization called the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance. And it's a registry where patients um, uh, participate in this trial. It's a natural history registry. And uh, uh, these patients are being followed once a year by FARA, the, the, this uh, research alliance. Anytime that we, um, and, and they've been very helpful because they keep the patients informed of what clinical research is out there. And they facilitate the entry of patients into clinical trials. Now, they don't... Um, recommend any particular trial, what they do is they, they tell the patients uh, and their parents which trials are available, and then they let the, the patients reach out to whatever clinical centers are doing the, the, uh, the research. So organizations like that, uh, um, natural history databases like that are extremely helpful. They also help us to understand the natural history so that when we design our studies, we know what is the natural progression of disease. How are we going to, and I think somebody brought this up before, what endpoints are we going to use? And how can we compare the results of, of the patients that are enrolled in our studies with the natural history data so that we can see if we, we're having an impact or not in these patients? So I do believe that registries are extremely important. Uh, they serve value to the patients. I think they serve value to uh, clinicians, and they serve value to those of us that are studying for drugs to address mitochondrial problems. Olivia? Yeah, that, that's, I can totally uh, um, echo that. Uh, I think it's, you know, we are, we are developing drugs for patients, and we want to know what's most important for patients. And, um, and that is, I think, where uh, patients and parents come in to explain to us, you know, what you think is most important. 
So currently we have four programs in the clinical development now. Uh, two of them um, actively include uh, pediatric patients like uh, Duchenne and uh, primary mitochondrial uh, myopathies. And those are areas that we actually really, really need the interaction with parents, um, uh, you know, primarily to tell us what they think is most important and to echo what, uh, what Alex said, you know, if we have discussions with the regulators, they are only going to listen to us if we show an effect of a drug on an endpoint that's clinically important. Right. And we can, you know, we can measure all kinds of fancy biomarkers and uh, do all kinds of uh, interesting um, research. But uh, in the end, of the, at the end of the day, if we don't change anything uh, that's important for our patients, then um, we won't get an approved drug. And also, I believe that we are not adding value for patients. So, I think that's that's what we that's what we have to focus on, and that's where we uh, want to you know um, uh, interact with with patients and with parents to tell us what to do. Can I follow up on that, um, which I think is an important point, uh, Olivia? You brought up pediatrics, and uh, you you're asking what can we as parents do. Uh, and I'll give you a, a personal example. Um, I have a friend who has a, a daughter who has Rett syndrome. She's about seven years of age. And one of the things that she came and asked me was, should I involve her in a clinical trial? And it's a very difficult decision for a, for a parent to involve their children in clinical research. But if we don't have children in clinical research, we don't know what drugs can do to help children. So for parents, you know, I know it's very difficult. Um, it's a very, very, very just difficult decision to make, but you need to trust your, your um, you know, neurologist or cardiologist or whoever it is that uh, has a scientific and clinical background and know that uh, particularly in pediatrics, although in all patients, safety is the first thing that we care about. And um, mm -hmm. the only way that we're ever going to know how we impact a disease is if we have participants of all ages, including pediatrics. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think in, in the clinical development, the, 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 the base rule I always use is, would I give this to my kids or would I give this to my mother? And so either in pediatric development or in uh, in adult development. And if I can answer with yes, then I think I'm 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 doing doing a good job. And um, I'm totally uh, agree with you that we can only progress if we can uh, do development. And for development, we need patients. And um, yeah, and that development should be ethical and should add to the value of the patients in the trial. And if you cannot do that, then you should do uh, something else. Um, so yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah, we'll over to another question we got from uh, from uh, parents, but I just on this last question before we move off this topic, Dan Di, Dan Di Pietro, I'd love to hear your take on this on involvement of parents and the importance of parents in pushing these programs ahead. What's the most important message to us? Um, I agree uh, with uh, Olivier and Nancy completely on the the value of natural history. I know that's probably not news to to the parents because I'm sure. Uh, a lot of the parent patient advocacy groups have been um, really at the forefront of developing natural history protocols um, and funding those. And, and those the the importance of those can't be um, under you know under under understated. Um, I do think that as it relates to FDA, um, I think our experience at Modis is that uh, especially for diseases that um, maybe the FDA hasn't encountered before, which is which is off, which is not uncommon in, in rare disease uh, drug development, where you actually have to educate the FDA on the disease. Uh, kind of getting the FDA to recalibrate the risk-benefit calculation, um, I think, is very important. And hearing from parents about their experiences with the disease, either through uh, letter writing or if there's a formal relationship with the company, with informal interactions with FDA, if that can be um if that can be arranged somehow i, I in our in our experience it, it's helpful um to, to to get directly involved that's great thank you uh so we got about five minutes left here in this panel um we got a great question from one of the parents so this is about 
uh, and I think it's appropriately addressed to John Campbell. It's about data sharing. Um, so, you know, the, uh, this uh, person rightly points out that we all understand that companies need to make uh, uh, money here. All right. At the end of the day, you're running businesses. But you know, we'd love to hear more about collaborating and uh, data sharing of information across companies to um, to help help the entire industry to to move forward. Um, and, uh, you know, John, I, I'd love to hear about, you know, thoughts on fair data, clinical trial data sharing efforts and uh, what you think could be done in. Um, in the Mito community, what is being done and what could be done better? John, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, it's a great question and, and it's a contemporary one. And it's one uh, that I think uh, there's some seeds, uh, you know, in, in the ground that, that are growing uh, that's going to help us, uh, you know, share data across uh, across stakeholders in the process. Uh, you know, the natural history um, is, is, a, is a big limiting factor for many programs and many diseases because of the rarity. Uh, and sometimes these data exist, sometimes they, they don't exist. But, uh, you know, when you run clinical trials uh, with placebos, you know, these data are potentially shareable. And I think among uh, the folks here and, and our colleagues elsewhere, you know, this is appreciated, uh, but there's a lot of logistics that go into uh, trying to, uh, you know, share share data. But I think very importantly, you know, the realization is there, uh, and and the patients, from the patient's perspective, you know, these data uh, are their data. And, and they they have a right to say where these data go and who use these data, and and they should exercise that right. They should demand that they're educated uh, with respect to uh, how the data will be used. Um, but I think um, you're going to see as as time goes on uh, an increasing demand for sharing of data to minimize the burden on the patient to participate in say, observational studies for the sole purpose of generating natural history data that, in fact, may exist uh, in one place or another, but that company doesn't have access to it. So, um, you know, I think it's a great question, and, and uh, it's something that uh, we're moving forward with. Um, there's a paper now uh, that should come out uh, at some point in the future. Um, with uh, the lead, you know, academic researchers with some industry players uh, that will uh, hopefully shed some light on the importance of this and, and some of the ways that we can move forward logistically to make it happen. Great. Brian, you are still there, yes? Yes. Great. So, um, as you're, uh, I ask you to put on your chief business officer hat uh, as you think about um, this question. So, you know, we hear about price tags for orphan drugs in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. If, if and when gene therapies ever happen, they could be in the millions. Scary for parents. Um, very curious for your perspective on um, the status of orphan reimbursement coverage by commercial carriers, uh, as well as government payers such as Medicaid. Um, and then any thoughts on likely out-of-pocket expense for parents uh, if and when these therapies are available patient assistance programs, any advice you can give us and your thoughts on, on coverage of these drugs? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I think it's important for the payers. I think it ties back to the earlier discussion on endpoints that are chosen to show clinically meaningful benefit to the patients. Um, and these obviously have to get through regulatory approval as well. We've done a fair amount of work with payers in the United States and in Europe looking at this question. And most payers come back to us and say that if you can show us clinical meaningful benefit and they estimate what that cost is going to be um, to their population, they will um, accept the uh, and pay for those uh, medications with prior authorization and with different hoops that have to be jumped through. So then I think the challenge can be is how stringent and how difficult is it to get through those hoops? And then secondly, what system do you have set up to ensure to show the payers that the patients are compliant and seeing benefit out in the real world ex experience? as well as the patient access program. So I think it all comes together. 
Um, but I do think that the payers have recognized the importance of orphans, but that doesn't mean necessarily they're going to make it as an easy access for us to get to the patient. Brian, let me let me put you in a, an unfair position. So um, let's just imagine that Olivier's company has tremendous success, brings a product to market that has um, an annual um, price, headline price of four hundred thousand dollars, and I'm a parent and I discover that this is this is available or three hundred thousand dollars, whatever. Let's imagine it's an ultra orphan disease state and the numbers in the hundreds of thousands of dollars per annum, uh, and I have commercial insurance, Blue Cross. What is a parent? Um, should I do to make sure that I can get my child on drug covered as fast as possible? First off, congratulations, Olivia. You got one across the line with that, so that's that's awesome with that. But uh, you normally, what I would say is if you get in, there's going to be normally with payers. So, Kevin, in my previous life, I'm a farm D. I worked on the payer side. So yeah. normally, what the payers are going to require is they're going to require a, an expert in the field to prescribe it and give the rationale and that the patient kind of falls within the population that was studied. And they have to fill out a fair amount of paperwork to get that in. So first would be get to the appropriate physician. Yep. Second, check with your payer to see what paperwork or requirement they, they want to see for that, for that prescription to go through and get approved with that. And make sure that all that information is sent in. Many times it takes two or three tries. It's usually done by specialty pharmacy. So if you can find out who that specialty pharmacy is, that's, that's supporting the company is very important. So you can provide them information and it'll bounce back and provide additional information. And then finally, make sure that, that your, your son or daughter stays compliant because the last thing that a, a payer wants to see is they're willing to accept and pay for this drug. And then the patient becomes non-compliant and they have a lot of money out for something that's not gonna work. Okay. Well, with that, uh, we're going to wrap up this panel and hand it off to to the next group to um, give the parents a chance to actually respond to some of these questions from uh, from Pharma. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so, yeah, that was a very interesting discussion, and uh, I have the opportunity to ask our parents questions that Pharma and Life Science have submitted, and. Um, First, I'd like to introduce Dan Wright. He's a parent advocate and philanthropist. He's been the leader in the fight against mitochondrial disease for more than three decades. When his family began their journey, there was hardly a place to get basic information, let alone a therapeutic. While Dan and Pat lost their daughter, Kelsey, in 2015 at the age of 34, their family continues to support the progress for researchers and family. Dan also sits on the CHOP Mito Advisory Camp Council. We also have Rick. He's also been involved uh, with mitochondrial disease since 2007. He sits on uh, the UMDF board and has been instrumental in helping to support legislation in Washington that benefits all of mitochondrial disease. His son is currently a freshman in college, and he's also sit he also sits on the board at CHOP Mito Advisory Council. And lastly, we have a newly diagnosed parent, Lauren Ashwin. Her daughter, Delta, was just diagnosed last month with the mitochondrial disease, and she is searching on how to become more proactive um, uh, to accelerate drug uh, discovery or treatments for her daughter. So I think we've got a great panel, and I want to start with clinical trials. Um, and let's go with uh, Dan. Uh, did you ever participate in a clinical trial? Um, and if so, what was your experience? Did Kelsey ever participate? In anything? Yeah, Un unfortunately, uh, and again, we're we're from the you know the dinosaur age, and, uh, and we were we were just trying to get drug drug companies to work, and uh, we would have uh, because we're we're a, we're a very strong believer. But but there was and during Kelsey's lifetime there was never a clinical trial she could participate with. Well, what about you, Rick? Yeah, we actually did participate in a trial at CHOP um, that uh, it was administered, so it was very easy to participate, um, and uh, it did not produce the outcome we had all hoped for. But we did participate, and we're really happy to be part of it. Great, and um, and how can companies make participation in clinical trials less challenging? And how can we get the word out that clinical trials are happening? How can we? How can pharma uh, help in that area? 
Well, I'll just say, I think, you know, working with all the patient advocacy groups that have a database of families is one way to reach out and to recruit participants. I think what Marnie is doing at CHOP is an incredible opportunity to reach out. I think the vast majority of parents would willingly participate um, in, in clinical trials. But it, can I take one second, Casey, and just thank all of the participants from the last panel. What you are all doing is so greatly appreciated, the support you provide to CHOP and the work that you do gives hope to a lot of parents. And, and that hope, decreasing stress and, and creating a sense, as, as someone said, keep healthy, there's good things coming, it means so much. You know, Dan, who we follow in his footsteps, as he said, he actually played some of the key roles early on in helping foster things that have come into fruition. But I just want to take that second to say thank you and tell you it has an impact. Um, and um, so it I does. Wanna... And I wish, and I wish we could speed science up, right? It's like you can't speed science up. So we're 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 ho we're moving as, as fast as we can, and hopefully. Uh, we will have more trials for us to participate in in the future. Uh, let's see here. Um, when evaluating, I guess, Rick, this is to you. <laughs> when evaluating whether your child might participate in a clinical trial, what factors carry the most weight? Site location, protocol assessment, duration of study visits, what is known about the investigational drug, et cetera? You know, as I said, we participated at CHOP and they made it easy. I mean, we came in, it was all, everything was done so well, so well administered that the logistics were not in any way a hurdle. I think the big consideration would be what are potential side effects and was the potential positive outcome. I mean, look, because as someone said, Olivia, I think, you know, the, the measure is would I do this with, for my child and for my parents? And that's our direct question. And so, you know, fortunately, we're with people like the like Marty's team, where you have such a high level of confidence that you're over that threshold easily. But I do think, to answer directly, Casey, it really is weighing and balancing potential side effects and potential positive impact. That's great. Um, I'd like to jump to Lauren, since she is a newly diagnosed parent, and is your participation what what are you what are your feelings about the clinical trials and what what's and did, are you interested in participating in a clinical trial and how would you carry the you know how would you evaluate joining a clinical trial i guess just what i proposed to to rick location protocol assessments i mean you are brand new into this so it's all um scary i, yeah. I can imagine <laughs> A little bit. Um, no, thank you, Casey. I think one thing to note is um, she was diagnosed with Lee syndrome and she's two and a half. So, you know, you've been given a death sentence. So we're willing to try anything and do anything and go anywhere. And, you know, so our threshold is low in terms of like risk versus reward. So um, that might be a consideration, Nancy, that you mentioned. Like, well, we can't really test it on these little kids because nobody wants to but they're, you know, take the risk. Um, but I think that there's a group of parents who might feel a little more desperate than that, that it might be willing to take the risk. So um, again, yeah, my threshold is low. We would go anywhere and try just about anything. Okay, I do, that's that's great. And so I do wanna add, so we actually participated in a clinical trial and we were in that trial for about a year and a half before the pharmaceutical company was acquired by another pharmaceutical company as that happens so often. And the drug, the, the trial was basically shelved. So my question, I guess, to how, 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 how do we know that this isn't going to happen or how, how do we, how can we feel comfortable enrolling in clinical trials knowing that this, this may absolutely happen? I guess that's a question to, uh, to the panel to the life science and pharma panel. If um, anybody wants to answer, <laughs> sorry. I, I mean, I could start, you know, I think uh, I would urge you to uh, utilize the resources that are available to learn about clinical trials generally. You, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, the longevity of, of, a, of a compound that's in clinical development is gonna, uh, be dependent on what phase of the clinical trial that you're talking about, phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, you know, and, and there's there's a lot of information that's available from your physician, from your medic 
mitochondrial disease provider uh, that can help you sort of uh, sift through, um, you know, what the potential projection would be. But there are never any guarantees. I think safety is the most important thing, and things can happen. Uh, and, and if a drug is shown not to really to do what it's hoped that it will do, I mean, it's it's not ethical to continue. So there's never any guarantees. But educate. Take the resources and learn. I, Casey, I can share one of uh, uh, what I think is a really, really interesting story. So a few years back, I was working in a company and we were developing a, a drug for a very rare disease. And it was acquired by a larger pharmaceutical company. And then they continued the development of the drug. But then that company was acquired by a third company that had a very complete different interest and said, you know, we're not going to do any of this anymore. So we saw that that was happening. And believe it or not, we went back, we bought the drug back from the third company. We founded a new company and we are about three weeks away from the FDA giving us a response on whether that drug will be approved or not. So what I would say is this, Casey, if a drug works, people will find a way to move it forward. Generally, that is the case. And, uh, and it also does happen that big pharma sometimes doesn't see the benefit of developing a drug for a very rare disease. So. Uh, my, 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 my inclination is to say, make noise, make as much noise as possible, because the more noise you make, the more people will know about it. And then people like Dan De Pietro or, you know, that wants to, to invest or put, you know, resources behind treatments for rare diseases, they will come forward and they will move it forward. Uh, and we did it for that drug. I think that for drugs where there is an opportunity to move forward, you generally will see a group that will want to do it. Thank you, Alex. That's that's great. Um, Lauren, I do want to ask you, since you are newly diagnosed, um, since Delta is newly diagnosed, where are families seeking information once they receive a diagnosis? Um, I think so once they're diagnosed, yeah. So. I mean, everyone goes to Google first and, you know, starts reading through a lot of the research papers and it's high level science that, you know, is way over their heads. So, I mean, we ended up landing in like family run support groups on social media. I found Casey using the hashtag Lee syndrome. So I wouldn't have been able to be connected to her without that though. So I really think social media is just the, is where we found, where we definitely found everyone and it found the most ideas and it found the most support and so yeah. great um rick do you have any thoughts on this <laughs> well you know it's i just big picture just to follow what some of the comments made in the last panel is that where we are today is so different than where we are when i got involved 15 or so years ago when dan got involved a few decades ago and that's where I think, you know, in terms of optimism for parents is it was hard to find any information. And you just doctor, you went to doctors all over the country trying to find answers. And now there's organizations like yours, the UMBF. There's a lot of organization. There are organizations trying to be helpful. There is so much more information available. And also, once again, to keep the, the optimism of there are answers coming if they're not here today. The level of support in terms of dollars for research from the NIH, Department of Defense funding research, the number of companies involved, the, the change that's occurred in a relatively short period of time is phenomenal. So uh, I think, as I said, there's more information, but more players involved, like those on the first panel trying to help uh, provide answers. That's great. Um... One of the other questions was, how does mito disease impact the lives of families? Dan? Uh, 
Yeah, that's 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 a really um, interesting one. Uh, one of the things I, I guess you know that, that it, it's it's a total family uh, situation, and and as you know, when you go back and look, you know, we've been. I guess this, in our case, it's it's been a forty year uh, uh, experience. Uh, you need to look at at uh, siblings. Uh, you know, how, there's there's so many things that you can get uh, so wrapped up in the day to day activities that that you really don't uh, continue to to work on relationships uh, uh, with the two parents with. Uh, with the kids, everything. I mean, it, it's uh, it, it it's it's a tough ordeal. Uh, I would also say that you know you you've got to continue to educate yourself uh, because to to build that that base knowledge and it's it's a uh, it's something that will help you uh, on down the, the line and help you again as it comes comes time to to look at at uh, the clinical trials, and it's just so easy to become completely overwhelmed. Uh, you know, you've you've got to continue to work at uh, making this progress. And I, and I think what Rick was saying, it, it there's there is a, a tremendous amount of hope uh, out here that that we know within the next few years we're going to see some things uh, that that are, they're going to help and. Uh, you just, you just got to keep that that positive attitude. Yeah, that's a, that's key. Positive attitude and keep moving forward, right? Um, let's let's go on to nutrition, uh, and this I guess could be for for any of you. Um, what is what nutrition and supplements? What's working, and how are you making these decisions for your children? Can I jump in here? Because this, as anyone on the call, and all. Apologize in advance to anyone who's on the advisory groups who hear me beat this drum regularly. And that is, I think the area of nutrition um, is an area for great opportunity, and we're not even close to understanding to the degree we could or should. Um, and I'll just say that part of, and I think someone referenced the, if there is a good thing to say about COVID, it did allow for a lot of convenings. Um, and um, I've been part of a convening about 35 mm -hmm. people from around the world academic institutions, researchers, and others just focused on mitochondrial function and nutrition. And what's real clear is that it's not just what you eat, but how you cook it, when you eat it, how you season it. There are so many different elements related to food that we eat and mitochondrial function that we are at the early stages of understanding nutrition and, and how it impacts mitochondrial function, even how one measures the impact. And I think part of the discussion that we've had also, there's a lot, there's not a whole lot of data out there as to how different supplements impact uh, the mitochondria and mitochondrial function. And as someone said, yes, every human being is different and stress factors, genetic makeup and otherwise. But I would just urge the companies and others that this is an area that there is so much opportunities related to learning in future um, and I think Dan would, would mention the impact nutrition had in his family and others on some of these calls. We just have so much more to learn uh, beyond just eat certain food groups. Well, well let, let me add in one thing on that is that so many times I, I hear people that they'll, they started off the mitochondrial cocktail and they say within, you know, Three or four months, they haven't seen any change, so they they immediately drop out. And I, I don't believe that's the way that 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 you really need to to be looking at these these things. Yeah, you know, Kelsey uh, lived for 34 years and uh, was 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 relatively healthy. And and I one of the things that we we continue to to give uh, you know some some credit to to making sure that. He had adequate uh, vitamin D levels, adequate uh, B levels. Uh, we, she started on, you know, coenzyme Q10 for for a, a long time, and, I, and realizing that that a lot of the new drugs will will be able to to help in these things. But I, I think ensuring 
you know, the vitamins, everything that you're doing, uh, that, that, that you're, they're watching all those things, uh, because it, you're not going to be able to judge this, you know, with a, within a few months, it's something that's going to be, uh, you know, in, in a period of years. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Uh, Vince, do you have any um, weigh-ins on this topic? Are you still with us? Yeah. So, I mean, most of the patients that we see are on it for years. And there's always the most chatter with talking to families in the very beginning of their therapy because you'll get, you know, minor GI upset or, um, you know, small issues associated with the, with, uh, the therapy. But I, I can say just from seeing a sample of a couple hundred kids that we deal with, uh, I would say at least 90% normally stay on therapy over a long period of time. And is it not only helping them uh, not to progress further into the disease as well as helping them physically from what they were missing before. It, it's tough to assess something of that nature, um, but I definitely do not see additional declines when patients are taking their medication and supplementation regularly and paying attention to their diet and especially having family support. Yeah. Uh, well, are there any treatments that have improved disease? And if so, what are these treatments or, or supplements? I mean, the, the majority of the things that we are all coming from yeah, yeah, Dr. Falks and Dr. Goldstein's office. So we're, we're arginine, uh, alpha lipoic acid, ubiquinol, leucovore, and all of your, your staple nutritionals that they're prescribing are, are what's making a difference in the kids' lives that I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. Does, Rick, do you want to weigh in on this? No, I just think we're doing well with what we know today. I just think there's so much opportunity ahead uh, to mm -hmm. learn more. And in addition to supplements, just different food groups that we're eating. And as I said, you know, we're learning how foods are even seasoned, how they're cooked, and when we eat them have an impact. So um, I just yeah. think it's such an exciting, I mean, even we heard uh, one of our advisory board meetings that even if it was organic or commercial had an impact. Uh, one of the moms talked about infant formula, uh, where uh, the child was about to get a G-tube, but switched to an organic, I mean, so. That happened to me, yes, that happened to us. We were on commercial products and we switched to organic and it's, I mean, all the symptoms that we had before are now gone. You know, it's amazing how much nutrition can play a part in, in mitochondrial disease. Uh, I know we're, we're running low on time, so I just have uh, quickly two questions to ask. Uh, do any of you have current uh, relationship with the life science company? And if so, how are you involved? For Dan, Rick, or Lauren? I'm not involved directly with any companies. We are at the conference call I mentioned, the weekly call. There are people from food companies, there's farmers even, and, and academic researchers and others, but not directly involved uh, with any of these companies. Okay. Um, we, we've been, uh, we're, we're involved with several. Uh, again, the, the only thing that I would, would say is that uh, uh, getting a drug approved is, is like uh, legislation. It's, uh, it's a massively long process and it's much, much harder, much more expensive and much more difficult than you could ever imagine. And uh, uh, it's, but the same vein, we're, we're, we're along the line, we're, we're moving along with a lot of uh, our, our drugs now. And, and I feel, I'm very optimistic that it's, go, that's going to happen. Absolutely, that's great. And I think that's, uh, that's it. That's all of our questions from, Pharma to the families, unless you, unless there's more questions. Casey, can I add, can I add something really quick on the nutrition piece? Sure. I just wanted to mention um, that with a two and a half year old, no matter how the Mito cocktail has, we what we've tried with her, it's very hard to get inside of a two and a half year old. So um, if there are, if anyone's just looking for directions to go, um, any 
like topical options or like gummy vitamin type things or things that toddlers can actually ingest is going to really help prevent her from getting a G2 potentially as quickly as she's going to have to get one. So um, I just want to throw that out there. It's everyone, all the ears on here I know are smart and powerful. So any ideas or any anything, please share. I could weigh in on that real quick, Lauren. Uh, it's really going to depend on what your mitochondrial cocktail is and the amount of medication provided in it. Um, if you have high dose creatine or one of the supplements that is very fluffy, it's very hard to put that into a gummy lozenger or gummy bear because only half of the actual product can be active ingredient. Plus you have to add in a, uh, a flavoring agent. If we also experiment with doing capsules or solid dosage forms, uh, many times that's not good because there is so much powder associated with the therapy uh, in the medication that we can't do it. And when I talk to patients, uh, being that our best options are generally liquids, and I always tell them it's like having the five pounds of flour. It's a lot of powder, but if you put some water on it, it disintegrates to almost nothing. So then our biggest challenge is texture and taste once we do that. So we do get the most bang for our buck as a liquid, um, and we just have to really try and work through the texture and taste issues. They're individual depending on the patient and individual depending on what medication was actually prescribed. It's just a process, and generally we change things four to five times before somebody is satisfied with what they're getting. And if I could make something pizza flavored, uh, people would love that, but you don't want to eat pizza for the rest of your life either. So th there's always changes and adjustments that are going to need to be made. So the, the best thing that I could say is it's a trial and error process. You just have to be persistent and you have to be out of the box thinking of, of uh, as, as much as you can just to try and get the kids to take their medicine. And if Thanks. anyone has ideas, we can follow up with you, Lauren. I think anyone on the call, other ideas to share uh, through, um, through Matthew. Absolutely. That's all the questions from this panel. So I'll hand it back over to Marnie. Perfect. Thanks so much. And I just wanted to weigh in on that last question, Lauren. The most creative father of a three-year-old I ever saw got it to go into a marshmallow. I don't know that marshmallow is sufficiently low glycemic index to satisfy our, our long-term goals, but that child was very happy. So again, I don't, I don't know that that works for everybody, but I, I think creativity um, throughout our, our, our session today, even getting a child to stand on one foot at two or three is, is not easy. So, you know, we, we certainly recognize how hard it is. And, and we are grateful to Vince and to the other pharmacies that go out of their way to, to make it happen because we agree the families often feel better, meaning the child <laughs> or the affected individual when they can get the medicines. Um, and I'd also um, advise families to talk to each other about G-tubes because I think sometimes the, the rap is sometimes uh, less than the actual experience. So I think talking to people who've had it done is, is a really good way forward. And I really want to thank everybody. Oh, was there a comment? Yes, yeah, Marnie, I, I, I want to talk about the G-tube. This is uh, right. Nancy Ruiz. I, I have a 27-year-old that has a G-tube. And um, it actually becomes part of your daily living. Um, G-tubes in, in kids are actually, um, they're called minis, and they're flush. They're like a little button on, 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 um, on the skin. Um, as opposed to what they do with adults where you have a tube kind of hanging out. And uh, it's, it's actually, it just becomes a, a normal um, part of, uh, of them, you know, either feeding them or giving them medication or what have you. So don't be afraid of it because it's almost like, um, you know, having your ears pierced, uh, I guess is the best analogy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I agree. Nutrition is incredibly important. And I think, again, any therapy that we give isn't in isolation. It's in the context of a human, right, who has nutrition, who has environmental exposures, who has other medicines. And so they're all key, probably, um, factors in the response to any, any therapeutic um, intervention. 
So I know I know we're at time. I, I don't see other questions. I'll certainly pause for a minute if there are any other questions. Um, we'd be happy happy to address them. It's just really a, a meeting of the minds here. I mean, everybody's above and beyond. Uh, those of you who participated in our six-hour CME day today, and then those of you who are here this evening, um, I'm delighted to share that I've been told we've raised over $40,000 today uh, to support mitochondrial research, and those are initiatives that we do that support everybody's research. You know, the data that supports uh, the data queries and the systems uh, to be able to um, help provide information more effectively when you need it for the FDA or for clinical trial design, um, for the staff to prepare um, um, all of the, the protocols um, that we're doing and provide the care um, to the families, for the research, um, and, and so on. And so we're just incredibly grateful for the support, for the community, um, and really for the direction. These, these meetings are incredibly important and impactful, um, really uh, just hearing where we're at uh, as, as some of you know, about a decade ago, I was spending all my time trying to convince people genetics was relevant. We don't even need to bring that up anymore. It's really a given. So there really is uh, value in education. And collectively, I think, you know, we're all on the bandwagon. Everybody has a very clear view that mitochondrial disease is heterogeneous and yet tractable in its individual forms. And when you put certain combinations together, it's, it's probably more than tractable. It's probably treatable. <laughs> Um, again, depending on what your available therapy is, what your uh, therapeutic goals are. So we've, we've continued to learn from each and every one of you, um, you know, as investors, as partners, as advisors, as uh, people telling us what's right and what's wrong. And we do hope that you continue uh, to work together with us. Um, we're certainly eager to see that arsenal uh, filled uh, with different therapeutic options that we know will benefit some patients and, and get the right patient uh, the right medicine at the right time. You know, a lot of the therapies that are being developed are for chronic um, interventions. There's also a need for acute therapies uh, that I'd, I'd challenge uh, the pharma community to help us think about as well. Um, there's also the need to think about therapies that are for populations, as well as therapies that are available for individuals on an emergency basis. And so some of the, the people on this call have been incredibly helpful getting us a therapy for somebody that might be outside the normal box who the, the trials might benefit. But we've seen in this past year life-saving examples where we got it to a different person and it was in time to save their life. So I, I do think you know communication, um, transparency, openness, data sharing, the extent that we can, and really participation with our eye on the ball, but the goal is to cure mitochondrial disease, right? That's our goal, that's your goal, and to do it, we need to work together. So really, I'm incredibly inspiring uh, to be able to participate tonight and to listen. I'm very proud of each and every one of you for your understanding of genetics. As a geneticist, I couldn't be more proud. <laughs> uh, every family knows their genetic diagnosis. Um, every group knows what next generation sequencing is, so really our work is done here, and we can focus now on, on really how to improve people's lives. And I think that's really the challenge. Um, I'm very hopeful that in the next two to three years there will be approvals. Um, I, I think the community is working really effectively together. I, I think I stopped counting, but we're, we're at at least 45 companies in the space. That's nowhere near saturation. Somebody on the call probably knows how many therapies are in development for cancer. Uh, John Campbell, I suspect if I were to ask you, you would know hundreds of companies, thousands? <laughs> uh, at least a few hundred, yeah. So we have to get a log uh, tenfold more uh, companies in the space, I think, to really start to not feel so overwhelmed that we have to treat every manifestation. But I think that the truth is, is that as this group does it, more will come. I think uh, Brian said it uh, really well. I do also want to thank our, our, our family participants. You know, across the generations, it's just remarkable the way you explained sort of living with mitochondrial disease for a month, a few years, a couple decades, and how and 40 years, Dan, you said, which is just, just mind-boggling. So um, Dan was right there when mito disease was found, um, pretty much, um, and he has been its, its number one cheerleader. And I think we're all standing on each other's shoulders, right? I, I don't even think sometimes we realize how connected we all are, how the actions of of one decade really impact the next. If the UMDF was never formed, you know, we would not have all come together. Diagnoses would not have all been made. Uh, diseases wouldn't have been recognized. Um, and that, that took about 20 years uh, before we got to the state where we're at now. So again, incredibly inspiring, incredibly grateful for everybody's time. Uh, we stand ready to support everybody 
Um, and we, we are um, inspired by the challenges you bring. We know we need to focus in nutrition. We know we need better natural history outcomes. We know we need better de data sharing. This is where we're focusing our efforts. But if you can think of other ways that academia can be helpful, uh, we, we would be grateful uh, to, to do so. Um, so please, you know, share your thoughts with us. If there's any thoughts now, I'd be grateful to hear, you know, additional ways that we can be helpful. But um, I think providing excellent care and having very high standards is something we have to maintain. Um, and we want to find, I think as a community, I'll just leave you with this challenge, really potent therapies. We don't want to find incremental uh, minutia. We want to find whatever it's going to do, that it's going to do it well. Uh, really well. <laughs> so that, that really should be our charge, um, that we're going to make a difference in people's lives. And, and I know that's um, how many of you, probably all of you feel as well. Um, so I will stop there and say thank you. Um, again, thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to our panel members. Thank you to our audience. Uh, thank you to our patients uh, who you know, put your time and effort with us um, you know, through the years um, as we, we work to stop uh, the losses and to really um, save people's lives and improve the quality of their lives. Can we also acknowledge and thank Marnie? Her dream to create this Frontier program has literally changed the world, literally. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I know everyone feels this, but thank you, Marnie, for making your vision a reality. Thank, thank you, Rick. I, I just couldn't have any more conversations with you and not get work done. <laughs> you made it clear 15 years ago we had a lot to do and we're doing our very best to get it done. So. Keep up the inspiration. You're, you're, you're very successful. I think, I think when we have an institute at the NIH, I've been told that that, that will be uh, truly successful when, when we have an entire institute. And, you know, I think maybe that's needed, to be honest with you, right, to really take this to the level where there's enough work and activity, right? There needs to be just a, an enormous amount of, of more of what we're doing. So uh, please uh, continue to maintain hope. Uh, continue to work together, and hopefully in a year's time, we'll have more to celebrate. <laughs> uh, God willing, one of you will cross the finish line, um, and our families will all be incredibly, incredibly happy. And I think Brian gave us some really uh, good things to think about, about having to get drugs paid for. Uh, that seems like a wonderful problem to have, um, and hopefully that'll be our discussion next year. Thank you, Marnie. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Marnie. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye. See you.